reminder that we are in fact at the Constantia Waldorf School. It's on now, you can speak into it. And at um, the Great Trial Project, just in case you thought you had been magically transported to the International School of Creative Genius and Diversity, <laughs> which is in fact the same thing. Um, wow! Um, we are so looking forward to what will come in the second half and tomorrow night. Um, it is intermission. You may go and find these incredible human beings at their stalls and have conversations with them, ask them questions, show interest. Um, some of it has been just incredibly fascinating and far too much for a simple brain like mine to take in all at once. Um, so, please. Also, feel free to go outside support the class 13s. They are deeply in debt. <laughs> So if you buy something, feel free to donate a little bit extra for the electric dance. Um, we will be convening back in this room at... Um, 10 to 8. At 10 to 8. There we go. Thank you. Cool. Ugly Man is a clothing brand that celebrates individuality and freedom of expression while disregarding ideas of gender and standards of beauty and ugliness. My name is Basil and I decided to take this idea that Jupiter and I came up with a while ago and make it into a reality. This project means a lot to me. As freedom of expression is a key part in accepting our identity, as clothing is a way for us to convey ourselves. Gender is so ingrained in our society and how we present ourselves. This restrictiveness on what is and isn't acceptable to wear boxes us into conformity. I feel people are scared of wearing whatever they want. There is a fear that you will not be seen for who you are and people's thoughts. I feel we rely heavily on clothes to affirm our identity and there's nothing wrong with that unless it holds you back. It's an, uh, mm. Clothing is a way to adorn your body in art. It's an extension of yourself and not something that defines your identity. We should wear clothes because we love what we wear and they give us confidence to be ourselves. Clothes are the medium and the body is the canvas. The themes that inspired this project are firstly the trans identity. I came out as a trans man two years ago and in the beginning of my journey, I relied heavily on clothes to affirm my identity. I felt that people wouldn't perceive me as a boy if I didn't present a certain way. I let clothes define who I was instead of feeling secure in my identity. Things shifted when I started hormone replacement therapy. It allowed for a period of growth. <laughs> yeah. Um. Where was I now? Uh, okay. Uh, it gave me the comfort in my body and my identity. It made me realize that no matter how I choose to present, it doesn't change who I am. Being comfortable in your body is a beautiful thing. When your body is yours and yours alone, your body is your home. And once you come to terms with who you are, you can wear whatever you want. Clothing has no gender. The next theme which Waldorf has deeply ingrained in me is the love for nature. This collection is an ode to the natural world around me that has shaped me in so many ways. I incorporated colors and textures of the natural world and one of the pieces I designed has shells sewn onto them which I collected from the Eastern Cape, a place that holds a special place in my heart. These clothes are not meant to be conforming, symmetrical or perfect. They are an asymmetrical, metamorphic unraveling of the self. And knowing yourself is not an easy journey. It is not a perfect one, but it is special because it is your own. Um, one of the designers, Choi Gisuk, whose surreal work inspires me, said that we have a right to fail. I believe challenges and endeavors themselves have the power to change at least a small part of something, even if they fail. I resonated with this because in the beginning of the process, the fear of failure held me back from even wanting to try. So this reminded me that it's far more rewarding to try something and learn from these experiences, even if it doesn't turn out exactly how you imagined. 
you gained infinitely more from trying than not having the strength to start. The process was not an easy one. I always knew I wanted to make clothes, but it always seemed far beyond my capability. I was very intimidated at first, but slowly and steadily, as I worked on sewing small pieces like bags and skirts, my confidence grew and the idea seemed more tangible. Each new piece I made, I could see that I was progressing in this skill. If you ask me how I learned how to sew, you might be shocked to know besides some sewing classes in grade eight, which I barely remember, I basically taught myself through a method of trial and error and many meetings with Miss Smart, who repetitively, repeatedly had to remind me how to sew pants together. This process has been a test of willpower and patience. I've had many screaming fits at my sewing machine that decided to break halfway through the projects. I was so close to giving up, but I'm glad I didn't. In the end, it has been so rewarding and it grew my confidence as I never thought I would manage to complete almost everything I had envisioned. I hope you take something away with away from this, even if it's the confidence to step out of your comfort zone and preconceptions and just wear something you like. I would like to say a huge thanks to everyone that supported me in creating this vision. My internal mentor, Miss Pumeza, and my external mentor, Andy. My parents for the unconditional support, to Beetle who crocheted some amazing pieces that you will see shortly. Go check out the Instagram, uh, I'll have it all at my stall. And also if you are interested, all these pieces will be for sale. Um, uh, thank you to Shirley, Ray, and my aunt Alida for the beautiful fabric donations. And last but not least, thank you to my models. I couldn't have done it without everyone's support. So thank you so, so much. <laughs> For those who don't know me, my name is Rowan and for my grade 12 project I started a, a small business, a small clothing business selling pants. Originally last year I was going to make a business selling little moon bags but I decided against this because I wanted to make something a little bit more functional. I wanted to make a clothing brand to explore its potential in my future career, career path. So I went ahead with it. The first step was to learn how to copy fit a pattern onto cardboard and Ilza Menk taught me a whole lot of things that I really needed to know. So, <laughs> second step was to learn how to use the industrial sewing machines. 
and then I was complete. I had completed my first sample. Now I wanted to find a design that I had sort of designed myself, so I tweaked. The, I copied another fit onto cardboard and tweaked it up a bit until I was satisfied. So this is me just experimenting with different kinds of fabrics, and then I also made a belt to go with it. After I got the right pattern, I put it into the sizes, and now it was time to produce the pants. So for this, I needed a little bit of capital, so I sold olives and some moon bags, and uh, once I built up some capital, it was time to go and buy the fabric. So I bought the fabric, and after buying the fabric, we cut up, I cut up, um, I cut up the fabric on Ilza's industrial machine, which as you can see, I don't know if you can see here, but I have to use a steel glove because it's, yeah, it's quite dangerous. <laughs> um, once I had prepped all the parts and everything was ready to go, next step was to meet Avril, the seamstress. And Ilza introduced me to Avril and this is when things start going all hair shaped. <laughs> I collected the trousers and I realized that somewhere along the line the communication hadn't been the clearest and I had sewed on the pockets wrong, so the different color pockets on the different color pants. So. <laughs> but um, initially I didn't think this was much of a problem, I would just have to redo the marketing and stuff, but <laughs> after speaking with Ilza she, she said, okay, let's just Let's just re let's just take these back to Avril and let her research it and let's do it properly. Okay, so once I got the pants and they had all they had all completed, I uh, put the press studs in them and shrank them in the wash. Last part of the process was for marketing and I'd spoken to various people and everyone sort of suggested that I start up an Instagram and then later I can start up a website. So for now I just I just focused on a little bit of the photography and Crystal helped me with this and a few of my friends. Thank you. <laughs> Major lessons that I learned in the, through this project were through in communication and how how good it how good it is. <laughs> you can see how important clear communication is. <laughs> I also learned if I wanted to take this business further, I would have to either like produce a lot more or just have it as like a side hobby sort of thing. So I'm still deciding what I'm gonna do with it, but yeah, might make an next batch of pants in linen. So if you're keen just come sign up this one. <laughs> Thank you. I'd love to thank. I'd love to thank. I'd love to thank Ilza, my external mentor, for being so generous and helping me through this process. I'd love to thank my family for driving me everywhere, and thank you to everyone else who helped me. <laughs> Good evening. Can you hear me? Good? Okay. Good evening, everybody. My name is Fernanda Wiley, and for my grade 12 project, I made a book about joy. Or rather, I asked people all over Cape Town what brings you joy. And from those answers, I compiled a book. I always knew that I wanted my grade 12 project to have an impact on people, to make people feel connected and moved. And I wanted to do this in the form of a book. So I thought about the things that make me feel this. And it made me think of videos I've seen of people asking strangers on the street personal questions, as this has always brought up feelings of depth for me. I also read the Book of Joy by the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu and found a quote about joy which resonated with me. Discovering more joy does not, I'm sorry to say, save us from the inevitability of hardship and heartbreak. In fact, we may cry more easily, but we will laugh more easily too. Perhaps we are just more alive. Yet as we discover more joy, we can face suffering in a way that enables rather than embitters. 
We have hardship without becoming hard. We have heartbreak without being broken. I knew that I wanted the question that I asked people to be positive, as we spend way too much time focusing on the negative when in reality there is so much good in the world. I ended up with the question, what brings you joy? I initially thought of what makes you happy, but happiness is short-lived, whereas joy is long-lasting. I also wanted to add an artistic element into my project, just as an additive, not as the main thing, and I landed on doing etches as it's something I enjoyed, so I did etches of everybody's faces I interviewed. So I started thinking out the logistics of what order I was going to do everything in. And in a meeting with my internal mentor, Lulu, she made me aware that I needed to get consent forms in order to interview people. So I would hold the two consent forms, one for minors and one for adults. Then I started emailing people regarding interviews. I knew from the beginning that I didn't want to interview inside of my bubble, anyone inside of my bubble to ensure that I got a wide range of people differing in age, religion, culture, and race. Also, if I interviewed someone I knew but didn't choose them for the book, I knew this would create an awkward situation that, to be honest, I wanted to avoid altogether. By the end of April, I had done all of the etches, which took place all over Cape Town in places like hospitals, organizations, universities, and many other places. There were two places that stuck out for me. The first one was a soup kitchen called Auntie A's Community Soup Kitchen, part of an organization called Women of Westlake. There I met Anthea, and she introduced me to all of the volunteers. Then she took me upstairs to her home where I'd be conduct conducting the interviews. I set up and people started coming up slowly that I could interview. Then it got very fast. Then only after an hour and a half, I had interviewed 40 people, volunteers as well as people coming to get food. What I enjoyed about this place was that there was a huge sense of community, as well as everybody was super positive. The second place I went to was the Cape Peninsula University of Technology. There I interviewed students in the emergency medical department. Everyone that I interviewed was a young, youthful adult, and it was extremely interesting to hear their point of view of joy, as it came from a place of still learning in the world, but no longer a child with less experience. Once I had completed all the interviews, which was a total of 100 interviews, I went through all of them and I chose the unique ones as well as the most, some of the most frequently said answers. This left me with a final of 50 responses for my book. In term two, I wrote all of the interviews in neat as well as doing all 50 etches. Then it was time to compile the book. I did this on a software called Adobe InDesign. Um, and once I had completed the design, I sent it off to be printed. I got it back, uh, the first draft. I was extremely happy with it, but I had done one minor error. I corrected it, sent it two days later as the final book printed. I was consistently learning throughout this process, due to the fact that the majority of the things I was doing, I was doing for the first time. I was met with the challenge of communicating via email, which I did not like to begin off with. Now I can say at the end of the process that I hate it. I find it an extremely inefficient way to communicate. But it just taught me that when I am relying on other people and there's a deadline involved, I just need to factor in extra time. I was nervous to do the interviews initially as it meant that I would be meeting people all by myself. But once I had actually done the first set of interviews, I no longer felt nervous but rather excited to do, to do the interviews as it meant that I would be meeting people. Um, I also like doing the layout of the project, for the, the layout of the book for the project. Although it was stressful because I'm really, really bad with electronics and I had never used the software before. And it was the last step of the process and the deadline was very soon. I did find it extremely rewarding to see the last nine months of hard work condensed into a book, as well as seeing an idea of mine become a reality. My biggest concern was after doing a couple of interviews, I saw that there was a common answer, which was mainly family and friends. And although it was good to see that there was a common denominator of what brings people joy, it wasn't good in the context of making a book, as I couldn't fill all the pages with the same answers. But this resolved itself, as out of the 100, I was able to choose 50 unique answers. I would like to share two interviews that stood out for me. The first one was in the soup kitchen at Westlake. There, I interviewed a seven-year-old girl. She said that being warm and having jerseys bring her joy. I thought this was a very cute answer, but it stuck in my head. And once I had thought about it for a while, I realized that her answer had a lot more meaning than I had originally thought. 
This girl has experienced not having a jersey, causing her to be cold, which has made her aware of the joy that being warm brings her at the age of only seven. This is something the majority of us here have never had to experience as we have uh, owned at least one jersey at a time. It was answers like these that made me appreciative of the things that I had taken for granted and without knowing bring me joy too. The second interview I did was at the Kadampa Buddhist Center in Observatory. There I interviewed a 22 year old man who grew up with Buddhist teachings. When I asked if I could interview him, in true Buddhist style, he said that he was too young and still learning or bring some joy. But after a while, he agreed to be interviewed. Throughout the course of his interview, he didn't use um or like once, but rather sat in silence and thought about what he wanted to say and didn't fill up the silence with things he didn't think was relevant. What he said was in order for him to understand what brings him joy, he looks at the things that bring him sorrow and misery, and he reverse engineers those things into positive conditions in order to experience joy. Now this answer I did not think of a young, as a young, unexperienced answer, but rather a profoundly wise way of finding joy within your life. Um, I'm now going to play a video of some interviews that I did. The majority of these interviews um, were not in the book, but I still thought were relevant. What did I say again? I'm kidding, the shy. <laughs> what brings me joy is spending time with my family, um, walking on the beach, um, reading a book, a very interesting book, um, eating chocolates. <laughs> I love chocolates. Um, camping with my family is also what brings me joy, mostly for spending time with my, 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 my relatives, the ones that are so close to me. Mm -hmm. I love that and also love spending time with community children, the job that I'm doing now that brings me joy, giving to the less fortunate brings me joy, uh, making food every day, coming and making food for them, um, cooking, serving it to them, making sure that they have a meal to eat, that brings me so much joy and seeing their smiles on their faces just by giving them something that they don't have that we think nothing about but the next person um, appreciates it. Mm. So that for me brings me joy. What brings me joy is the cold, fresh, open waters of the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> love swimming. Um, and then also what brings me joy is birthdays. <laughs> I love celebrations and birthdays. And thirdly, I love popcorn. That brings me joy when I eat popcorn. Bring me joy is happiness of from kids <laughs> and old people and helping out my community. Bring me joy is uh, my family <laughs> and my friends <laughs> and the community around me, the environment around me bring me joy. What brings me joy is to have good health and to feel good about myself and so I try to build on that every day. And the women bring me joy. <laughs> My son brings some joy in my life, mm -hmm. my dear. It's an everyday. I get to wake up. And what brings me joy is to watch TV every day. My children and my family make me happy every day. And sometimes they give me trouble, but it's not a lot. <laughs> sometimes my grandchild. He don't want to listen, then I talk to him, then he say, no, it's fine, Mama, I won't do such a thing again like that, and so on. <laughs> and what brings me joy is music, because like every time when I feel like down or I feel lonely, I basically listen to music and it like up with my soul, it makes me happy. What brings me joy in my life is to spend time with God and spend time with my kids. Yeah, yeah what brings me joy is my friends and my family. And what brings me joy is to be with my family. Um, spending some time with friends. Um, and love. Love makes me happy. <laughs> so, I remember waking up. It was weird because I hadn't waken I hadn't woken up. Every other time I'd been to bed before the morning. I remember waking up in the middle of the night, it was really weird. I kind of looked up, trying to look at the stars. The way I was sleeping was kind of in the middle of this clearing. I remember look, waking up, trying to look at the stars and seeing no stars, just seeing this big, this big grey cloud. 
and I quickly realized what was what was happening. And I, I rummaged around my bag, found this plastic bag, chucked as much as I could fit inside, and jumped inside as well, and held it around my held it around my, my neck. And I, I just lay there between these two rocks, kind of waiting for the rain to come. It wasn't long, maybe two minutes. And the rain started coming down like really hard and really fast. And it actually started hurting my face. So I looked around to see if there was any kind of like leaves or something I could put on my face. I couldn't find anything. So one of the things that didn't make the cuts to my bag was my hat. So I, I reached over, took my hat, put it on my face. Didn't take long for that hat to get very wet and kind of made it hard to breathe and it was kind of uncomfortable. And it was starting to get really uncomfortable. You know when you've got something like behind your back and it's can't really move and it's starting to get damp and it's wet and it's like, and it was really just an uncomfortable situation. I was starting to look really miserable. But it actually wasn't. It was like the happiest moment of my life. <laughs> for, for like four or five hours until sunrise, where, just, where the rain just stopped and the birds started waking me up. Well, not waking me up because I didn't even sleep. <laughs> but I was, just, I was just full of joy. It was the happiest moment of my life, I think. I was just, oh, that, that's what pulled me just. Um, my name is... Uh, and for my class of project, I went and lived on an island for a little time. So the vision, the vision was to find a wild remote place to spend some time with, but just by myself, um, with as little as possible in terms of material help, technology. Um, obviously, the vision and the idea often don't, don't equate, don't, they separate to what actually what happens in the end. But I really turned out I'm very happy. Um, on the island, I changed completely. Like I said, I didn't really have a sense of time. I kind of just looked at the sun. Um, not, not properly, not just kind of. Um, <laughs> and and, that, and like, I, just, I just switched up completely. Like, like the way I acted it was just it was totally different. My bodily rhythm just changed completely. I was not hungry at breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Completely different times. I, didn't, I just went to bed, woke up with the sun. Um, yeah, I completely look. I forgot what I looked like. I didn't remember what I looked like at all. Just really weird. If you look at my my little store there, there's a lot of photos of myself. Almost like a tourist, which was, I wasn't a tourist on the island, but like I was taking selfies. But I had no idea what I looked like, which really weird. Um, yeah. So as I was saying, the the I didn't want any technology or any of that kind of thing, but I did. I was convinced to bring a a disposable camera. Um, luckily, so I can show you guys what happened. So. I didn't show him it too much. I remember the important bits, I remember the, I do remember the good bits. So look, I'm gonna, I do, I do, I do. Like I'm gonna show you guys and talk you guys to see some of the photos. I don't know if you guys can see with me here, so I might just sit down, because I'm not sure important, but these are not. Um, and I'll talk you guys to some of the photos, and yeah, that could be cool. So this is the island. Oh, I'm still on the <laughs> This is the island. What am I going to do? <laughs> this is the island. As you can see, incredibly naturally beautiful. This was a good weather day. It was just right. This, the island was two hours boat drive away from the nearest big settlement, um, Cape McClear. Now we found some nice locals. Me and my dad. My dad was in the boat with me, wishing you well. We found some nice locals who were happy, and I'll show you guys that now. So that's me just about to jump onto the island. Um, stressing, obviously, but, but trying to prove to myself that I'm ready, and also to my dad, who was a bit worried, rightfully so. There was obviously an uh, element of preparation and planning that was obviously necessary, but I also wanted a feeling of, of kind of just being chucked onto the island. It wasn't so much survival orientated, it was, it was more, you could even say spiritually orientated. I wasn't, I wasn't, there were already I needed to survive, but, <laughs> But I mean, it was more about just having some time to think. So that's me, just jumped off. I don't know if you can see me there. Um, yeah, my heart's beating very quick and I'm kind of looking around. For the first two days on the island, I was, I was like in like, especially the first day, in, in, in like, like really hyper-focused and like hyper-alert, almost in survival mode, which I didn't want. Like if anything, I, there, was, there was a lot of like animal life on the island and every time something like, like went out and get a big fright. I got a big fright with my water monitor lizard, which gave me a big fright. Um, more, and, more and then later, we actually became really good friends. <laughs> and then, no, it's not even like one of the generic things, actually. Um, it's the next photo. So that's my dad took this photo. All the other photos are, are my little disposable camera, 
what this photo my dad took. That's me in the distance. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. That is the neighboring island. So there was a kind of a bunch of islands. And that's a, that was a really big island that was navy. You can see also bad quality because it's a disposable camera. But there's bare bad. And it's just, you know, it's just very wild. It's a jungle. And that's the first photo I took. I was just very excited. I just, it was very steep, the island. So it was just, you know, it's like a peak. The island's a peak that kind of rises above the water. And it was very steep, so I kind of checked up. So at this point, I was scouting for where I was going to set up camp. And I, I, I just remember just looking up at this. I was like, oh, no, I can't sweat. Um, this, uh, this picture is kind of not too impressive if I don't explain it a little bit. That, that tree is actually massive, and the rocks are boulders. Um, <laughs> they are. They are. That's also not, the, it just kind of gives you a little bit of sense for how jungly it was. it was. It was very wild. And a lot of the, I did a lot of exploring, but a lot of, the, a lot of it was inaccessible. A lot of it I couldn't get around. I was also quite scared of snakes because that was one of the things that could go really wrong. There were, I, I felt so safe on the island. I felt that I was being protected. I felt the island was looking after me. And one thing I forgot to say, one of the, one of the first photos, as soon as I jumped onto the, to the, the island, I was like, oh, so am, I, am I welcome? Am I allowed here? And, and I got a good positive response. Um, yeah, I felt, I felt very careful, but I still, there are still some real dangers. Crocodiles are around. I don't, I don't know if I'm just, I'm not sure. I heard things about them there. <laughs> and, and snakes are definitely around. So there's lots of little, yeah, lots of, yeah waterborne diseases, also a big, a big issue. Um, that's also not the most impressive photo I've seen. <laughs> But, but that, that was right behind where I was sleeping, so that means that it means something to me. Um, I, left, I ended up leaving the island exactly how I found it, and I was really happy about that, except, except I left this little mark on one of those I was really pissed off. Wow. That's a beautiful uh, little picture of the side, right over there by those rocks is where I spent most of my time just looking, looking over the water. It was incredibly beautiful, as, as often it happens, a photo can't really portray it. It's really happening. Um, but yeah, it's insane. And just above, there's, there's all kinds of amazing animals. Right above that little overhang, there was this bird nest. It was really cool to just watch all the different birds. As I, when I first arrived, there weren't many birds and lizards or anything, but by the last day, they were everywhere, like everywhere. Like, I mean, the ants especially, they were everywhere. <laughs> So then again, I'm not super self-absorbed, and or maybe, but like, <laughs> like this is just the, this is just because I mean, this is that's the first day, that's the second day. I I, I was just so happy. I was, I definitely want to go back, and I was just I don't know. I was just just happy. And that's the fourth day, and that's the fifth day. Obviously, yeah, just the fourth day was the best. The fourth day was the best. It's a great day. I got a lot of good thinking done, and, and it was awesome. <laughs> That's me getting a little bit contemplative. <laughs> that's my, that was my view, so I was lying down, and if I looked up, that's what I looked up. So sometimes I kind of felt a little bit, because that's just looking straight up Lake Malawi. It goes on for a while. Oh. Also not the best photo, really, but again, it's a little shitty display. <laughs> um, those are the blue zebras, and Lake Malawi is famous for its little fishies. Yeah. That is my favorite photo from the island, and this. I, 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 it just makes me very happy, although I'm starting to sad now. Um, that's a fish eagle. On the first day I saw him once, the second day I saw him maybe three times. And the third day was bad weather, but the last day, he, it was his island, and he, and, and he was just everywhere. He was, and, and that was the last photo I took on my disposable camera, and I just, I didn't know how it turned out. And again, the photos developed. I was just, I was just so happy that I got him perfectly in the middle there. That's what I woke up to every morning. Um, I later figured when it's when it's especially beautiful, it's going to be a it's going to be rain, and that's me straight off off the island, off the island onto another island. But this one's got people on it and and all of that. Um, then there's some very necessary interviews. Um, similar for helping with this speech, I often struggle with trying to get what I want to say across. Um, Simri, thank you very much. See you. And then Ray, this is Simric's my, my internal mentor, Ray's my external, was my external mentor, and a, a proper real life mentor. I didn't really see you, but thank you so much for everything. You introduced me to a new way of thinking, greatest influence and impact in my life.
Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I was lucky enough to be invited and included in helping him run some of his Call of the Wild camps, or one of them so far, and some fire workshops, helping people make fire sticks. Um, and then my family, my family, especially my dad, this is really one of those times where it would not have been possible without you. Thank you, Dad. That was, that was really, yeah. And the, we drove up, he had work in, in Lusaka in Zambia, and um, we drove up and just spending so much time in the car that he was really special. Busy guy, that was very nice. Um, I see a lot of my dad, I'm not like, I'm not like <laughs> but, um, And yeah, he taught me so much, and it was so good that I got like close companionship with someone before, before just being by myself. So my family, I'm gonna forget, and that's sorry, a terrible, I'm sorry, but my friends, thank you guys so much. And yes, uh, that's it. And, and yeah, yeah. And the other day I was practicing my speech in my house and not going to say something she really liked, so I thought I'd include it for her. But it was, it was what made this project so special, all the amazing people around me, even though I was alone on the island. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Mila. Since I was young, my love for art has always been influenced by my older siblings' involvement in the design fields, which is what inspired me to take these nine months to create my own jewelry brand called Muktu. Deciding what to do for this task was very difficult for me because I immediately knew I wanted to do some sort of handwork or craftsmanship, but it was so open-ended that my mind went to a hundred different places. Initially, I was set on restoring a Harley Davidson with my dad, but custom constraints had led me to explore other ideas. A photography portfolio then came to mind, as it's always been a passion of mine that I've never fully devoted my time to. And to be truthful, I think I would have chosen this for my project if it weren't for the fact that I simply forgot. <laughs> I then rationalized the ideas that I remembered, and finally settled on making grills or dental jewelry. I knew this would be a good option for me because I'd have access to all the resources and materials that I'd need, and it's always been something that I've been intrigued in. I've only ever seen them online, and I think they're mainly popular in the US, and I don't think they've ever been readily available in South Africa, so I thought it would be a good thing to change. I immediately then asked my brother York if he'd be interested in being my external mentor, and I was very happy when he said yes, as he's had many years of experience in the jewelry industry. For those unfamiliar, grills are ornamental tooth covers that specifically fit over one or more of an individual's teeth. They're typically made of gold, silver, or platinum, and I chose to stick with silver as it suited my style and budget more. I embarked this journey as a novice and soon discovered that girls have fairly simple stages of creation and in my opinion require more skill than they do knowledge. The process all starts with designing, which we've had a lot of experience with in our design lessons with Marcus. Finding a style was quite easy for me because I already had some sort of concept of what I wanted my girls to look like. Regardless of my confidence, I then took to social media to get some inspiration and see girls' full potential. Most of my designs are influenced by hearts and stars in lots of different shapes, and I also drew inspiration from an art style called cyber sigilism, which is very commonly used in um, the tattoo industry. Um, it uses a lot of modern and organic shapes. The first set of grills I designed are a set of open face fan caps that fit over your canine teeth, and the second ones I created were another pair of open face fan caps with little stars in them that you can see on my logo. After those two designs, I became a lot more confident and I was able to create some very unique grills. Although designing felt like a big deal at the time, it was probably the smallest part of this process and I had no idea how much work I had gotten myself into. With designing out of the way, I could then start molding my first set of teeth, which was for some reason very scary for me. It definitely felt the pro made the project feel a lot more real having to work with physical objects. To mold the teeth, I'd need a gel called alginate, which is very commonly used in dentistry to mold teeth for braces. I was absolutely clueless as to how I'd get any of this stuff, so I asked my dad if he could ask his dentist to lead us in the right direction. Um, and then he kindly gave us a sample bag of alginate and a mouth plate to bite into. I put molding off the teeth for weeks until I finally forced myself to do it, where I found that it was actually a very simple process. All I needed to do was mix the alginate with a cup of water, so my brother and I went outside, accompanied by some of my friends, with some room temperature water. As we discovered, the colder the water is, the quicker the alginate will set, so the room temperature water gave us some more leeway. 
I was then the test dummy to my own experiment, which I have to say was absolutely disgusting. To have cold goo shoved in your mouth is one thing, but for it to harden around your teeth is another, and definitely not pleasurable, not to mention the drool. <laughs> it only takes two minutes to set, but it definitely felt a long, longer than that. Now that I had the teeth impressions out of the way, I could fill them with casting powder, which I actually didn't have at the time. What I didn't know is that the um, alternate impressions only stayed accurate for 14 hours due to its loss of moisture, so I'd have to remold all the teeth anyways. Eventually, after scouring the internet, my brother helped me find something called Ultrasafe, which is intended for making statues at home. But it turns out they use the same materials as dentists do, so in the bucket was one part alginate and one part plus of Paris. Since it was intended for larger statues, the mix lasted a lot longer than one use, and I ended up getting around 15 plus alginate molds from it. I was so excited at this point that I wanted to make rules for absolutely everyone, which was, of course, unrealistic, but I knew that from the beginning I would have Jacob or Jack Sobs as my test subject. I got both of our teeth molded and cast at home in some very homemade yogurt tubs covered in hot glue, and I would then pour the casting powder into it, which was very easy to use. It set overnight, and when I took them out in the morning, I was very chuffed to see that they came out perfectly. This meant I could start the next scary task in my process. I think I found starting new steps very intimidating for me, but I definitely got better with that over time. Waxwork is where I found that creativity could finally take over, as the previous steps felt a lot more practical. This stage felt like it lasted months. I mean, it did, but it felt like it lasted a lot longer than that, just because I had to teach myself everything from scratch. There were so many things I had to remember, like how the girls would feel in your mouth, the comfortability, the practicality, and most importantly, the shape. Marcus, my internal mentor, then supplied me with all the necessary tools and wax that I would need to begin. It wasn't only important to remember that the wax needs to shape the tooth, but also that it cups the surrounding teeth in order to hug your tooth properly. This is something that I had to learn the hard way through so much trial and error. Waxwork, I think, is where I experienced the most frustration, just because of how delicate and precise I needed to be through the whole process. I cannot count how many times I'd almost completed a design, only for it to crack or crumble. One of the first issues I faced was that I had not lubricated the teeth impressions before putting the wax on, and this meant that when I tried to remove them, I either chipped a tooth or scrapped an almost finished design, which was a different type of letdown for me. I did, however, learn my lesson, and I found a lubricating spray that worked perfectly. From that point on, my designs became a lot more practical. I carried my wax, my candle, and tools with me everywhere I went, to my friends' houses, every single one of my classes, and occasionally some restaurants. <laughs> Whilst I was designing, I sent my first batch of wax wax stick cast into silver, which was, once again, scary and intimidating. When I got my first castings back, I was very sad to see that only one of the pairs I had made had made it out. The rest of them had snapped or crumbled, which was very discouraging for me, but it definitely showed where I went wrong and what I should do differently. I found that a lot of my designs were too thin or fragile or didn't even end up fitting the teeth properly. Another issue we faced is that the caster had placed the sprue in the wrong end, so the tooth ended up losing its shape. If you don't know what a sprue is, it's kind of just like a little stick that they put onto the wax before it gets casted. The set that I had managed to salvage actually ended up being one of my favourites as it showed my progress throughout the months and I learned to love it over time. I then spent the remaining months finishing all my wax work so I could take them to get casted, which was the biggest relief to me. I think I definitely could have made more girls, but I decided to stick with my first few designs as they showed my hardest and most refined work. When I received my second batch of castings, I was very happy to see that they had all made it up pretty much perfectly. It was the last push that I needed to finish my project. I sat in almost every single break and in my room until early hours of the morning, sanding and filing my girls, which was very finicky, but I remained motivated throughout. I don't think anything could compare to putting on one of my girls for the first time and having them fit. It was the exact delayed gratification that I needed. A few of my pieces didn't end up staying on as well as I'd wanted, so I found a solution that did feel a little bit like cheating. I didn't think at my age I'd be calling multiple stores, seeing if they stocked denture glue, but I had to do what had to be done. I was absolutely thrilled to find out that the glue worked perfectly for girls that were slightly too loose for my liking. The glue isn't permanent at all and sticks immediately and stays on until you want to take it off, which only takes a little wiggle. In the end, I was finally left with nine finished pairs of grills that I am very proud of. I did expect myself to make a few more, but I realize now that it's my own sanity and quality over quantity. 
Overall, I've been taught a lot about myself, and I showed that I'm capable of managing my time and creating something I can say I'm proud of. It's opened up a lot of new possibilities for me in a world of creativity, which I'll now show you through some process photos. So, this is my... This is the design spreadsheet that I created on Procreate. I actually didn't end up using this a lot. Um, I kind of made my designs up as I went with the wax in my hands, but it was definitely a good base to have in the beginning. And these are my very dreaded Elgin and Molds. Probably my least favorite part of the experience. Um, this is where I could cast the teeth. Um, on, in the middle is Jacob's teeth, on the left or right is mine. Um, and this is my wax works. Uh, these would eventually be taken in to get cast into silver. And then these are my castings. <coughs> uh, you can see in the bottom right where the screw is sticking out, which ended up making the grill lose its shape. And then this is where I could finally add that element of photography into my project. Um, Jacob and I did the shoot very last minute, but I was very happy with how all the photos turned out, and I was, had a lot of fun editing. If you are interested, I do have an Instagram <laughs> if you'd like to support. Um, I'm thinking of taking commissions in maybe a month or so once I've given myself a break. Um, and if not, you can go visit my store in the bottom corner over there. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Firstly, I'd like to thank my internal mentor, Marcus. Thank you so much for letting me use your space wherever you are right now. Um, and dedicating so much of your time to me, it does not go unappreciated. I'd then like to thank my external mentor, my brother, York. I love you very much. Thank you so much for giving me so much of your time, letting me use your space, materials, and some of your money. <laughs> thank you for being so supportive and my mum, dad, and sister, thank you so much for your, all of your support and funding this process. Yeah, and well done to all of my friends. You guys all did amazing. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. I am so glad you all made it this far into the night. Um, I will be the last person presenting. My name is Jacob Jacobs, and for my Great Talk project, I created a 12-song album named Octopus Salad. The name Octopus Salad came from an unexpected encounter in a Nurtig restaurant. There was a special on the menu called the Octopus Salad, which made me very, very happy. <laughs> It sounded like such an amazing meal, but it turned out to be a lesson in underwhelming reality. <laughs> the disconnect between expectation and reality got my brain working. Love, a subject often painted in vibrant colors of excitement, can also reveal shades of despair. This album allowed me to explore this duality, how love and romance can sound and look so good, but end up with a bad taste in your mouth. <laughs> Choosing such a bold and weird name was intentional. The album itself mimics this. Interweaving heavy synths and resonant rock guitars, I wanted this to be full of surprises on first listen. But the deeper you listen, the more heartfelt and sincere it becomes. I also wanted to create something that no one has ever done before. As a broad term, I would classify this album as a rap album, but I think it's much more than that. I wanted to introduce a new sound into Cape Town, and I think that this album is truly the beginning of that. Although I didn't think this album would have so much emotional weight, Initially, my intention was just to cross something cool and fun and nothing serious. And for those who know me, you know that I usually tend to joke around and I don't take many things seriously. And even when it comes to making music, I make songs with no real substance. But um, I'm so proud to announce that I've done something that I didn't think I could and I made something which has a meaning. I created the entire album by myself. I made the beats, I mixed them, and I wrote and sang every lyric from my room. Since I was responsible for everything, I struggled finding inspiration and motivation to make a new song every time I opened my laptop. I wanted every song to be able to stand 
I wanted every song to be able to stand by itself and still mean something to a bigger picture. Something else that was bad was that I went into this project with no or barely any knowledge of mixing, which was my biggest regret. I should have spent more time learning how to mix and master my songs and less time focusing on quantity. Although with the skills that I did have, I was able to make the song sonically pleasing, but nevertheless, I do wish I asked for help earlier. It's humbling to admit that I should have asked for help earlier because I went through this process thinking that I can just do anything and that I don't need any help and that I can just do it all by myself. But in a world of artists, collaboration can offer you new perspectives and it's always great to ask for the opinions of other people. My creative process consisted of me sitting at home trying to make a decent beat for hours on end and after scrapping those hours of work, I come back days later, months later, filled with new inspiration. I learned something very important during this process, which is to give your work time to settle in. I recorded songs in the early days of this year, which I hated, but I came back to months later and found new inspiration within those. Crafting unconventional melodies and experimenting with unorthodox sounds became my favorite part of the process, sparking a sense of wonder within me that I never thought possible. Reflecting on this album's journey, I think I definitely improved in all aspects of music. I started off not fully knowing my capabilities, and I lack many skills which I now have. My overall creative thinking has improved, and my style and my lyrics have greatly improved. This album is the beginning of something beautiful, in my opinion. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to have these great soft projects, because it allowed me to find my path, and I will continue to make music. goes out to everyone who helped me. Um, thank you, Larka Terry, for the photography of the album, which you can see in the CDs. And thank you, Hot Ink, Lisa Saville, for the production of my CDs, which you can find at my store. Thank you, Marcus, for your design um, help. I really appreciate that. And then, obviously, thank you to my parents, um, it wouldn't have been possible without you, financially, and your emotional support also helped me a lot. And then, biggest thanks in the whole world to Ben Houston Brown for the production of the music video which I will now show you. Thank you.